Okay, uh, up next we have our first panel of the day on folding schemes uh, with moderator and panelist Nico Monblatt from Geometry and panelists Justin Drake from the Ethereum Foundation and Benedict Buns from Expresso Systems. Hi, thank you very much. Thanks for the intro, Chloe. So I am uh, Nicholas Monblatt. I'm a cryptographer at Geometry. And I have here today Justin Drake and Benedict Bunz joining me on the panel. So we're going to be talking about folding schemes. I have a pretty sort of ambitious uh, schedule for us up ahead. Uh, so sort of covering the basics, what folding schemes are, talking about performance, talking about security. I want to also try to talk about like what's beyond and what, what are the alternatives. And hopefully have a bit of an open Q&A. Uh, before we dive into all this, can I ask you both to introduce yourselves to the audience and actually to myself, because I don't think we've met in person, Benedict. Uh, I'm Justin Drake from the Ethereum Foundation. Um, I do a lot of research on upgrading Ethereum and making it more secure, the layer one. Um, and I guess we might use folding in the context of VDFs at layer one, as well as for snarkifying the EVM, basically making the EVM um, an enshrined rollup. Yeah, my name is Benik Buns. I'm the chief scientist and the co-founder of Espresso Systems. We work on decentralized shared sequencing, but I also have, uh, I'm a researcher working on zero knowledge proofs, and in, in recent years, a lot of my focus has been on folding schemes. Amazing. Uh, so I think, Justin, you started touching upon this already. Um, why are we interested in folding schemes? Sort of what are the, the motivating problems that we've seen in the world that led us to think about these problems right I mean the, the, the big thing the big primitive that we're interested in is snarks and I think uh, folding schemes bring us to a point of optimality uh, in many ways uh, on the one hand um, they're they tend to be extremely simple so like Kolmogorov of complexity uh, tends to be very low um, they seem to reach uh, you know peak performance just be optimal from a constant standpoint even if you're assuming uh, elliptic curves. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, this has all sorts of consequences. For example, the fact that uh, we've reached a point of optimality might mean that we can finally standardize, right? Because every six months we come up with a new improvement, but since we've reached the end of the road, then now maybe we can start building uh, folding ASICs and whatnot. Would you like to add anything or? <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, I think that uh, folding schemes, they give us this primitive called IVC, called incrementally verifiable computation, um, which is a computation that sort of runs forever. So think of a blockchain, it's a computation that runs forever, but at every step, I can actually give you a proof that the computation was done correctly up to this point. And like sometimes this is referred to as recursive snarks. This is actually not quite correct. Recursive snarks give you IVC, but folding schemes are something actually much simpler and weaker that still give you IVC. And IVC itself has many applications, succinct blockchains, VDFs, but even like you can build a snark, right? Because you can just like formulate your computation as a machine, like as a Turing machine, right? There's, there's computation steps. So it just gives you a snark itself. Um, and uh, yeah, I think what Justin said about like the constants just being sometimes one uh, is, is very, very intriguing. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I guess um, w one of the things that you can do is like, because the constants are so good and the cost of the, rec the overhead of recursion is so low, you can have uh, real-time proving. So the, the end game that I'm, that I'm thinking is you have a CPU and then you have some sort of coprocessor right next to it. And within one millisecond, it gives you a proof of whatever you've proved on the CPU. Um, and another really interesting aspect of IVC is this um, distributed proving with untrusted provers. Um, so you could have provers all around the world, for example, on the blockchain, and they're all working together and they don't have to trust each other. Okay. 
Um, I'll actually come back to that a bit later, maybe like towards the end of the discussion for the sort of beyond folding. We've said folding a good dozen times, if not more. Uh, I think it's time for us to sort of define what we mean and sort of explain what it is. Um, yeah, Benedict, maybe? Do you want to take it? Up? Yeah, sure. Um, I guess we'll, we'll get into the naming discussion, but uh, the, the idea of uh, a folding scheme is that essentially it's about batching. Um, you know, that's yet another name that, that nobody used, but maybe that should have been the name. It's instead of normally when I have a proof, um, I verify it. But what if instead of verifying the entire proof, I could take two proofs and just batch the verification together. And what I have to do, in, you know, normally in these, these IVC schemes, I prove that I've checked a proof. But now with folding schemes, I just prove that I've correctly batched the proofs together. And this gives me some new batched object, some, some accumulator is, is also what it's called. Um, and then at the very end of the chain, I just check that the accumulator is correct. And the important property of these folding schemes is that if I check the final accumulator is correct, then this implies that all of the previous things that I, I folded into this one accumulator were valid, were valid proofs. So I reduce basically the, 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 the um, uh, checking many proofs into checking one proofs. But the important thing is that I can do this kind of in this iterative manner. Um, and I iteratively prove that each folding step was correctly, each batching step was done correctly. I mean, I would go in even further in saying that um, yeah, it is true that we're technically, you know, batching these proofs, but the, the proofs are the most naive proof you could think mm -hmm. of, which is like the, the raw witness, like yeah. the instance itself. So really, I think of it as, uh, you know, batching the instances themselves, the witness mm -hmm. themselves, and you, you're doing almost, well, no pre-processing on that. There's no proving step, really. The proving step is delayed to the very end where you want to compress this folded instance to something that's maybe constant size. Yeah, I think I've heard you talk about these schemes in the terms of like uh, a proving preprocessor, like, yeah, some work you do and eventually you do the proving, right? Um, so batching, accumulator, lots of, I guess, words that come through this line of work. Do they all mean the same thing when we say accumulation schemes, split accumulation schemes? Or are there minute differences? Do we care about these differences? Um, yeah, of course, they, they, there's minute differences. I don't think that mm -hmm. most of them are not that important. Um, uh, it's just historically, like um, we had these papers in 2020 about accumulation schemes. Well, first of all, there was Halo, which sort of started this, this work, um, this whole idea that you could delay some of the verification, and then we had these works on accumulation scheme, and then afterwards Nova came out. Um, but there is one difference, and this is, relates to what you just said. It's so oftentimes, uh, like folding really talks in, in this language of relations, um, where I fold the witness of a relation, and most of the time that is enough. Most of the time I will just fold the relation. In accumulation team schemes, we do talk about, oh, I'm going to badge the proof verification. And there are schemes, like in, in Protostar, we had this really efficient lookup uh, protocol um, where the, the, usually this works, all of this works in, for schemes that are algebraic and low degree. So where the verification is um, you know, some low degree verification. For R1CS, uh, for, for NOVA, this was R1CS, which is just a quadratic check, so a degree two equation. And then later works um, have extended this to, to sort of arbitrary degree D equation. But then we also have things like uh, lookup, which isn't inherently a low degree check. But it turns out through one round of interaction, we can turn this into a low degree check and then accumulate that. Um, so that's something, that's one example, and, and maybe there are more, where you do actually, you don't uh, fold sort of like uh, one witness, but you actually fold a proof. And, and I do think we should, like most of the time the proof is trivial, and, and I agree with that, but I think just, just looking at sort of this language of relations does seem to be, at least we have one good example where it is, where it is limiting. 
Um, but you know, folding is definitely a better name than accumulation. I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sounds better. Okay, glad to see we can convert to folding. Actually, to your point now, I've been giving this mental model usually now for folding schemes where it's sort of this reduce and combine approach. So you sort of have a strict instance, you're, the problem you start with, and you want to make it into something foldable, mm -hmm. right? So in the case of Nova, it was relaxed or 1CS. In the case of Protostar or Hypernova, we now see this thing where you do work through some of the steps of your protocol, and only then do you start accumulating. Um, no question there, so just echoing your point. Um, I want to talk a bit about performance of these things. So we said, right, uh, we're optimal down to constant, and even the constants themselves are optimal. How did we get there? That sounds crazy, right? No? <laughs> you don't seem surprised. Oh, go ahead. Do you have an answer? Yeah, it does seem too good to be true. I mean, what, what, what happened for me uh, as a story is um, I, I kind of discovered Nova, you know, almost at the very beginning, a couple of years ago, and um, you know, they were very, very useful for, for VDFs um, and really got us the performance that we wanted. Uh, but no one was looking at them. And the reason no one was looking at them is that they had, well, maybe that's an exaggeration, <laughs> but few people, few practitioners were looking at them. It was, you know, they were using... Halo 2, Graph 16, you know, Fry, whatever. Um, and I think part of the reason is that they had, they had all sorts of constraints. Like on paper, um, they were not really snarks, right? Because you had to do this final uh, compression step. Um, and the, the verification time was not very good because the, the, the paper described this compression scheme which reduced the, the size of the proofs, but the verification time was still linear in, in, in one step. Um, it was only compatible with R1CS, which was not very attractive, uh, and had various other kind of annoying things. And I think the way that I saw it as this kind of this, this rough diamond that needed polishing, and over several years, I guess a couple of years, we've managed to, to fully polish it, and now I think we have something which is, which is production grade. Right. Was it also a case of like applications and use cases? Because I think Nova was advertised talking about VDFs and so IVC. The average practitioner isn't building an IVC system, right? If I'm building just an application, I just need one snark to verify. Um, I think most practitioners will move towards IVC. Okay. <laughs> For every kind of application? For many applications, okay. yeah. Um, I mean, I think the primary application in, in blockchains is just uh, ZKVMs. Mm -hmm. And once you have that primitive, you can do so many things. Um, Fair. Yeah. And I think, like, maybe a slightly different perspective on why it's sort of what has enabled this, like, from a mathematical perspective to be so damn efficient is, is um, that, and we show that this actually works for, like, you c it works for any protocol, is literally all you need to do is take a random linear combination. Like, that is, that is all you need to do. Um, is is uh, you take a random linear combination of, of your accumulator and and uh, your new um, proof or relation or whatever, right? So that's literally this is why the constant is one. Uh, you take one of them, and then you somehow deal with kind of what comes out of it. But um, it's like the primitive. What is just so beautiful is that the primitive is so damn simple but it gives you something so powerful. And the, the primitive that we're relying upon is this additively homomorphic um, vector commitment, mm -hmm. which is kind of the, the simplest kind of thing which has like a little bit of additive structure. And that gives us actually hope that we can patch maybe the last final weakness of, of folding schemes, which is that they're not quantum secure. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we basically, we just need a quantum secure additively homomorphic vector commitment, and then we'll be able to just reuse all the technology that we've, that we've built. I'll add to that, it, I don't know if it's the final hole in this <laughs> Polish diamond. There's also this thing that we have to use curve cycles, right? Which can be quite annoying to either find or work with or reason about. Right. Um, Alpha leak. There is a paper coming out soon okay. that improves Big alpha leak. <laughs> <laughs> things. Okay. Um, before we, so I do want to talk about curve cycles and uh, the bug that was recently uh, 
mm. shown in the Nova implementation. Before we get there, I also want to talk about more specifics about the performance. It seems like right now the state of the art is kind of Hypernova and Protostart, as far as I understand. And it seems to be like two camps. Oh, you <laughs> don't agree with the... Oh, I just think Protostart is better, but it's uh, <laughs> very nice. I, I agree. Um, <laughs> no, so there seems to be two camps, the um, sort of the sum check camp and the kind of random linear combination approach. Is there a superior approach? You just said you think Protostar is better. Yeah, I mean, you can just look at the constants. Um, and I, so I think the, the right, like this whole idea in, in, in folding schemes is to do as little as possible. And um, the what you can do is you can formulate so the the sum check you can view everything as a sum check you know like if you any random linear combination is is essentially some form of a sum check the question is basically do you run the so-called sum check protocol which is mm -hmm. this famous protocol from I think 1992 um, which is like is extremely verifier efficient, right? It, it allows you to do some sum check over some, uh, where the verifier only works logarithmic and like it allows, it allows you to do a random linear combination where, you know, like sweeping a lot of things out in the rack, but the verifier is logarithmic. Um, but that is not what we need in, in, um, in folding schemes. We don't actually need that the verifier is efficient we only we can do that at the very very end. We can push that to the decider. So um, in uh, Protostar, we don't run the sum check protocol. There's still like some sum over a bunch of terms. That's the random linear combination. But you you just uh, you don't have to do that. You can kind of fold that in, I guess. Um, where are these things compatible? Well, at the very end, you get something. You get some big proof. And you might want to outsource checking that proof or deciding that proof is, is, is what it's sometimes called. Um, and this is where we can use standard snark techniques. And some check is a beautiful standard snark technique that has many applications and is perfectly suitable for, um, for these kind of settings. And so that's, I think, where these things are compatible. OK. Um, I think now is a good time to move back to the point I just mentioned of curve cycles and the, the recent bug. Um, I think, is either one of you able to give a brief overview of what happened, or? I mean, the, the non-technical overview is that um, Srinath didn't prove the scheme with the cycles. He only proved the, the non-cycle scheme. And, and then he just said, OK, the cycle is an optimization. I won't even bother proving it. Now, I have another story to share, which uh, kind of led to a similar bug, which was um, actually with RSA-based VDFs. We were going to do this amazing kind of MPC with a thousand parties. And, and, and uh, we, basically, the authors of this, this, this amazing paper uh, kind of had proofs in the base case. And then there was like two or three optimizations that kind of left almost as an exercise to the reader. And it turned out that the optimizations completely broke the scheme. And so I guess the, the moral of the story is always prove the damn optimizations. It's, it's just to be like very precise, what is important is the Nova paper itself actually does not have a bug because it does not describe this scheme and neither does like you know, in full like fairness, neither does our work on accumulation scheme, our work on Protostar, or um, the the Halo work. So none of these schemes describe it, or any other work that I know, like uh, um, Sangria, or n none of these works. I think really describe it formally and prove it. The the chain of cycle curves uh, case, they all just mention it, and then in the implementation of Nova, uh, he obviously you know, uh, obviously uses. A, a chain of uh, like a cycle of curves and uh, then there is you could call it just an implementation bug but I think that would be wrong because it's well where does it come from well it comes from being underspecified and then it's very easy to to get wrong and there was some additional data and this additional data allows you to to uh, break the scheme so we agree prove the damn thing <laughs> as you just said Justin <laughs> who who's responsible for this who like as in, no, but <laughs> uh, not to point fingers, but it's more saying like, 
<laughs> who should be doing this? Do we expect academics to actually prove every single like optimization that's going to be implemented, or do the implementers need to actually turn to the papers and extend the proofs that are already out there? Do we need some kind of collaboration? Yeah, I mean, I think definitely. I think like it's it's hard, right? Because the, the easy answer is like, oh, you know, you should prove everything, and you know, blah blah. blah. But then. Uh, like, uh, you know, we probably don't get like five folding schemes papers a year, right? Like there is a trade-off here of, of, you know, trying to make schemes simple to describe and easy to understand versus like, like ideally, right? Like you give a full specification of your scheme and academic papers are not full specifications of schemes. We definitely still need that step and it's sometimes a little bit of a thankless step. Um, and that is an issue, right? It doesn't get the the sort of it doesn't get the um, attention or the um, like you don't get the reputation from it that that maybe it deserves. Um, although there's right like there are great you know I think uh, Zcash always does an amazing job of yeah. giving like very detailed specifications, and I mean this leads people to use their libraries. Um, so I do think yeah it probably should be a collaboration. I also think that. You know, this specific case, like, is a great opportunity for someone to give, like, you know, some generic compiler, which is almost essentially what mm -hmm. they did in, in the in the Nugent Bonnet uh, SETI paper. This yep. this one, they not just what they did, which is good. They didn't just show like here was a bug. They also said here is the actual proof of how it is secure, and um, yeah, I mean that is one saving grace is like. Like for me, the saving grace is like, do I, you know, people always complain about peer review and they say like, well, peer review doesn't find bugs. And you know, it's like, uh, what are like all of this academic stuff is bullshit. Like nobody finds the bugs. And to some degree that's true, but if something is important enough, then it will get more attention, right? Like you have to just sit, let it sit and marinate a little bit. And eventually someone like will, will find the, the, the bugs. I think that Yes, the more proving you know things in your paper, and especially if you describe it in your paper, then uh, you should be uh, like then you should prove it. Like you shouldn't have. I mean, this, there's another story I think from the the one of the snarks that they Pinocchio or one one of the other snarks that they used in Zcash in the Zcash implementation. I think the Zcash bug was also like you can trace it back to some protocol in the appendix which didn't have a proof. Right, so this happens over and over again. You, you should, probably shouldn't have extra protocols in the appendix without a proof, and you should also be ideally like very specific about what you do and what you don't do. So, for example, if you say like, "Oh, you can optimize this with uh, with cycles of curves," then like say specific that like in theory, like you could or like we suggest that it might be possible or that it's likely possible to use cycles of curves. Um, this is not yet proven. We leave this for future work, right? I think this would be a good intermediate step. I mean, in terms of r reflecting of like how can I kind of try and 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 help um, avoiding these bugs? I think one of the thing, one of the powers that we have as as blockchain projects is the the power to signal kind of what is important. And so we can say, okay, Nova and folding schemes or, or a proto star, these are important things. You know, please go break them. I think we also have the capital to have, uh, you know, bug bounties. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, as you said, with Zcash, you know, they have this kind of this uh, really strong internal cryptographic team. And I think we've tried to do the same thing at the Ethereum Foundation. And I think part of the role of this internal team is to bridge the gap between the academic paper and the final implementation. Okay, I. Now I want to move away a bit from folding and sort of look beyond folding or what, what are the other options? Uh, because we've said the one requirement we have is additively homomorphic commitments. Um, the problem is those right now based on discrete log require large fields, right? Um, there's a whole other approach, which is let's forget about all this fancy folding. Let's go brute force full recursion, but let's do this with very small fields and very efficient um, like hardware efficient primitives. Do we have any way of comparing? So here I'm talking about like the Plonky 2 type stuff, like Plonk plus Fry and recursion. Do we have any way of comparing these approaches other than just implement and benchmark? Um, 
Uh, for comparing, I would say that implement and benchmark is is uh, is the gold standard. I think that's definitely true. I, I do want to say that, you know, like sort of uh, go back. I, it wasn't quite the question you asked, but like uh, the yeah. question that begs itself is like, does folding really like and even elliptic curve based folding really have to use large fields? And I think the answer is not necessarily right. So we talked about these constants. The main, like, the main cost of folding is committing to the witness. But what is really interesting is you pay a um, cost that is linear in literally like the bit size of the witness. So if your witness is smaller, like let's say each element is only 32 bits, well then you will only pay like that constant factor, right? Like you don't pay for the, um, you don't like in, in any other proof system that we know, like even if you start with small inputs, eventually things will get large and, and there's almost like, there's no saving of, of having, you know, like small witnesses. So maybe we can, you know, simulate smaller field operations, right? Especially with techniques like lookups, we could like even, even simulate like, uh, you know, 16-bit operations, so like have something that looks very similar to our CPU mm -hmm. or like a CPU from many years ago. Um, but yeah, like sort of simulate like these small field operations in a bigger field and um, then only pay, you know, these very, very small costs. So you're saying pack more witness bits per field element? I don't even need to do that. Just okay. have smaller, I mean, just have like like you have a full field, but if yeah. all of your elements are in the witness, if everything in the witness is just 16 bits, I then I don't pay like 256 times group operations. Mm -hmm. I pay 16 times group operations. So I do, um, and this is like very specific about, you know, these, these this is where the, the small constants really help mm -hmm. for these folding uh, schemes where I don't have to pay for, you know, like, uh, no matter how small your witness is, I pay some big, uh, like, I pay full field exponentiation per element. I guess, uh, uh, holding us accountable for, you know, what we just said, prove it. Is there any security issue there? If we restrict, you know, our witness to be on a specific part of the field? Uh, maybe, I don't know. Okay. Like, this is, yeah. I'm, I'm, do, I'm not saying this is a scheme, yeah, yeah. right? Like, Ripping I'm saying that, that there isn't, this fundamental barrier mm -hmm. of of using small uh, field elements. Yeah, absolutely. Like uh, we should, like this is not uh, this is future work section. I mean, one thing I'll say is that uh, on the hardware side of things, um, we're paying a, a big penalty because the CPUs haven't implemented these uh, these large multipliers. And once you go in the ASIC land, then the, the delta between a 64-bit multiplier and a 256 multiplier is like much, much, much smaller. Um, so this this will be bridged uh, to an extent with with ASICs. Um, and I guess there's there's another kind of uh, paper that's coming out of so second alpha leak, I guess, which um, also intends to bridge this gap using using lookup tables. So. Nice. Thank you both for answering my questions. I kind of want to open the floor to the audience. Um, if there are any questions, I see some raised hands already. <laughs> yeah, thank you for the discussion. I have a question about uh, soundness. So when we fold instances together, we introduce some kind of knowledge soundness error. And my question is, uh, how do these accumulate? And if they do accumulate, does this impose Come like a, a practical limit on how deep we can go in IVC using folding. Um, yeah, sure. So there's a theoretical and a practical answer. Uh, the theoretical answer is uh, it's a massive problem. Like you can sort of the the errors multiply. So even if or like the size of the extractor like grows. So if even if it grows by a factor of two, you can only do like you know less than a hundred uh, recursion steps. Uh, and suddenly you have something that is exponential and we cannot prove or say anything. This is the theoretical answer. The practical answer is like, there's no attack. We have no, like there's probably not an issue at all. Um, the theoretical and maybe even practical solution to this is uh, to build things in more of a tree-like manner where like the, the, the issue is the recursion depth, right? How many, like how deep is the recursion? Um, so 
if I if I fold a recurse or do IVC, and this is true for all IVC, this is true for recursive snarks, folding everything. Um, if I build things in a tree-like manner, um, I can get sort of the same number of items at the bottom, but f like only the a logarithmic uh, depth there. Um, and this tree structure is also the thing that's friendly to distributed and massively parallelized proving. Thank you. Uh, first, thanks for the wonderful panel. Um, I have, I do want to challenge a little bit about why we're using IVC as a framework, right? Um, so I think there is another way of thinking this, which is proof carrying data, uh, which is by uh, originally by like Alexandra Chiasa. Um, he, if you read his like original uh, like paper, right? He spent some times talking about the negative effect about like why IVC shouldn't be the framework of thinking this, right? I, I guess to me, it seems that the PCD is actually kind of more general things of thinking about like, especially if you have like uh, heterogeneous instances of uh, from from different parties, right? Would love to um, like learn your you guys' ideas about this. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think you're right. I mean, in my mind, um, the, the distinction between IVC and PCD is that with PCD, you have these untrusted provers. Um, but my understanding is actually like these folding schemes are PCDs. They have this untrusted prover aspect. So different untrusted provers can all collaborate. Um, what would you say? I mean, I, I think of it as, so you're completely right. But PCD is the more general primitive. Uh, the way that I think of it is, or I think the way it is even described is that IVC kind of works for line graphs and PCD works for arbitrary graphs, but um, you can actually build folding, you can build PCD from folding schemes. Like we did this in back in 2020, the, the split accumulation scheme uh, works perfectly fine for um, PCD. Ariel re very recently had some work extending kind of protostar to, to be able to handle more inputs. But even if you just have a binary input, you can just, you know, like make your like, arbitrary degree DAG, D DAG into a degree two DAG by just stacking things. So it's, um, this is, yes, PCD is really the primitive that we want, though it's the more general, but we can get PCD from folding. So there's, um, but IVC is simpler to think about. That's the only reason I would say. This is also maybe something that got lost in calling everything folding. Folding originally, like the paper specifically uh, considered the two to one case, right? You have two things, you fold them into one. The not predecessor, let's say, uh, split accumulation considers this many to one case and considers PCD specifically. Um, yeah, and there's also, I mean, you know, like then something that's not been worked on so much recently, but we did work on in the original split accumulation paper, and I'm sure was would be possible to get back. Is there's a very strong notion about zero knowledge in uh, for PCD, which is that. At any step of the computation, you can continue the computa computation without even knowing any information about what has happened in the past, right? It's like, it's not just that you can, con un it's untrusted what has happened in the past. You don't even need to know, get, re leak any information about it. The current folding schemes, I think like mainly for simplicity, are really not described as zero knowledge schemes. Um, but I'm sure we'll so soon see, you know, someone adding zero knowledge back. Um, and yeah, PCD is sort of the end primitive that we want with all the nice features. It's just simpler uh, to describe and it's a stepping stone. Yeah, I just want to add a little bit because from the many uh, distributed system like researchers and practitioners, right? I can see uh, PCD more useful in terms of like beyond blockchain use cases, right? Maybe we even want to like integrate PCD into our distributed system like cloud computing cluster so that uh, it's more like resilience, at least intuitively to me. Yeah. yeah, that would be amazing. I think there's one more in the front here. Yeah, thanks for the talk. Um, I was wondering, what are your thoughts on like using uh, folding for virtual machine type of circuits, like non-uniform non computation instead of just focusing on circuits? Right. Um, I mean, there's, there's, there's um, what is it called? Supernova uh, that uh, basically allows you to have 
um, multiple circuits that you're accumulating. And uh, so if you have a virtual machines with lots of different opcodes, you might think of like one, one circuit per opcode kind of thing. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think we're, more, I mean, people are trying to build like a ZK VM using, using Foldy. And more, we have, we have techniques like, like Supernova, whatever techniques we have. We have the Total Star also has a, <laughs> a different way of achieving, uh, you know, non-uniformity, so. Right, <laughs> and we also have the high degree gates now. We have the CCS. Um, we, um, we have all sorts of lookup tables. So we're, we're starting to get all the little gadgets that we need to build very, very complicated um, you know, circuits. Yeah, one, one interesting thing about you know, the constraint systems is actually that um, you don't even need, um, like Plong and all of the other constraint systems, they have a lot of structure. But it's, you know, like you can, in, in these folding schemes, it actually suffices to literally just describe completely different uh, verification equations per gate, right? You can just describe an arbitrary degree D polynomial and they have to be in no way uh, connected, right? Uh, normally, you know, in, in Planck, we have to do, um, I don't know, there's like sort of different gadgets and you have to formulate your equation as part of these gadgets. In folding schemes, it seems like you don't even need to do that, so. Um, it's a very intriguing way and yeah. One more thing I'll add and correct me if I'm wrong. I think with Protostar, the cost of doing this non-uniform ABC is like at each step you'll pay for your biggest opcode. Is that correct? Yeah, I yeah. think, uh, I th okay, we need to look at the details yeah, and yeah, again, yeah. you know, no unproven things. But I think uh, you, I think you literally only pay for what you're doing. Um, not just the biggest one. Not just the biggest this one. This one you're doing specifically. Okay. I, I mean, I think okay. we we described as as if they're all the same size, so it's a little okay. bit more okay. complicated. But yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. In that case, maybe the point is moot. But I was going to say it might sort of change the way you want to make your circuits for your VM. You might not want to do one circuit per opcode. You might want to pack them into similar size circuits to sort of spread out this cost. Cool. Thanks. Okay, that was awesome. Thank you very much, Nico, Benedict, and Justin.